How do you create a beloved character in a video game? Bracket. Am I cool now? <laughs> or does that even matter? And it's just about blowing shit up. It's really just about blowing shit up. Blow up a lot of shit. Blow up. Taking inspiration from the best dynamic duos around, Ratchet and Clank exploded their way onto the gaming scene figuratively and digitally. Getting there though was anything but easy mode. Leaving their much loved Spire of the Dragon series behind, Insomniac Games was tasked with creating a whole new world of characters and gameplay. From a few false starts, a cancelled game, to the insurmountable task of developing a game for the PlayStation 2, which was infamous for being hard to develop for. Ratchet and Clank was a Hail Mary for those at Insomniac, with fingers, toes, paws, and claws all crossed that the game would succeed. Little did they know that it would spawn more games, and I do mean more games, than merch, a full-length movie, and become one of, if not, the greatest dynamic duo in gaming. I'm Kev, and now let's rewind time back to the era of the PlayStation 2 as we take a look at the history of the original, the beginning, the beginning of the end, the end of the beginning, the OG, Ratchet and Clank. Unleash the history. Oh. The team is looking at me going, I you're crazy. Our level design ambitions push the limits of time and resources we don't want. This is probably impossible. And we would have missed our ship date in like months. Oh, Insomniac just took Naughty Dog's energy. Maybe the artists want to kill the designers. And I said, over my dead body. Which stretched many people to the limit. It would have been easy just to make Spyro 4. After all, that was what the team at Insomniac Games had been doing for the last three years. Each year, they had worked hard to come out with a new Spyro the Dragon game about a little purple dragon and a high fantasy platformer for the PlayStation 1. All three Spyro games have been a huge success. But Ted Price, CEO and founder of Insomniac Games, knew there was a problem. With every subsequent Spyro game, they pushed the envelope of new creative ideas and gameplay mechanics. Ted Price could see the team, as well as himself, was becoming stagnant. What more could they do with Spyro? As much as creatives hate to admit it, they're out of ideas for Spyro. Which is probably why for the third game, they brought in other characters that you could play as, not just Spyro. Another problem, or opportunity depending on how you look at it, was that two days after the release of the third Spyro game was another release, a big one. One that would change the world of gaming forever. Sony's PlayStation 2. Boasting its infamous Emotion Engine, that could produce graphics and performance no other console could match, at least at the time. On top of that, the PlayStation 2 hyped its internet connectivity, because back in the early 2000s, online gaming was a novel concept. Sony had pulled ahead in the gaming market with the PlayStation 1, and they intended to stay there. The addition of the DVD player to the system ensured that their competitors, Nintendo and Sega, were not gonna make a comeback. So Ted Price with his team at Insomniac, we're at a crossroads. Stay with Spyro, or leave the little dragon behind for something new. Ted Price was no stranger to moments like these, as he faced one just like it before Insomniac even existed. See, before his life in the games industry, Ted Price worked at his uncle's medical company after graduating from Princeton. Here, Ted learned the ins and outs of running a business. Then, after years of working in the medical field, he realized he had no passion in it for Ted had always been a gamer. Ever since he played Adventure on the Atari 2600, it showed him the possibilities of what games could be. So Ted gave up the medical field and started his own gaming company. A few weeks in, he realized his programming skills were trash. He needed help. Luckily, his mother knew the mother of a programmer, and through their mothers, Ted was introduced to Alex Hastings. But everyone seems to always call him Al. The two hit it off and began making games. As development progressed, Al brought in his brother, Brian Hastings, 
and the three of them would solidify the foundational core of Insomniac Games. The first game, Disruptor, a dark sci-fi first-person shooter, basically a Doom clone that was, well, as Ted puts it. People said, this is the best game that nobody's heard of because there was no marketing campaign. Disruptor may have been an utter failure, but with its variety of weapons and abilities, you start to see the groundwork for what's to become of a certain dynamic duo's arsenal. Another thing Disruptor did for them was get them under the mantle of Universal, back when the movie company was in its video game making phase, which put them on the Universal backlot, where they went on to create Spyro. Right next door to them was another upcoming game company by the name of Naughty Dog, who were building their own game, Crash Bandicoot. You can check out my video of the history of Crash Bandicoot on the PS1 for all the drama that went on over there. The two companies became fast friends, and Naughty Dog would prove a great help later on when we get to Ratchet and Clank. As a result, Insomniac making Spyro games from 1998 to 2000 for the PlayStation 1, what it did was it bolstered their relationship with Sony. So, as the PlayStation 2 came around, Sony was ready to back Insomniac fully. Universal was just the middleman. Unfortunately, Insomniac didn't own Spyro. Even though they created it, Universal did. Insomniac would have to give up their purple little baby to other developers if they wanted to strike it out on their own. Between creative stagnation, the opportunities within the PlayStation 2, and their great relationship with Sony, Ted Price, Al Hastings, and Brian Hastings, as well as the rest of the Insomniac crew, agreed. They would leave Universal and Spyro behind and venture out into a new galaxy of creative possibilities on the PS2. And it would prove anything but easy. Overlooking Barham Boulevard in Los Angeles, 20 developers lounged about with drinks. This was Insomniac's first brainstorming session about what's next in the aftermath of Spyro. The studio's stagnation had now turned to excitement as they began work on their new project. But that was also what was scary. The shadow of Spyro loomed large, and the gaming world had high expectations for them. So, what now? Well, it turns out they already had an idea. No. Not yet. It was an idea they had back in 1999. It was to be their PlayStation 2 debut title, known as Monster Knight, a third-person, real-time action-adventure game. You'd play as a girl named Maddie, catching and training monsters. Hey, doesn't that sound like... If you feel that sounds like Pokemon, then you'd be right. Yu-Gi-Oh! No, Digimon. No. Yeah, yeah, Yu-Gi-Oh! Ugh, whatever. It's not a stretch to think that Insomniac at the time wasn't thinking of jumping in on the huge Pokemon obsession of the late 90s. The difference being that in Monster Knight, the monsters you catch can be used as weapons, armor, items, and or transport. Catching monsters in the game was the game's way of giving you more abilities. Monster Knight was eventually scrapped. It never made it to even a prototype phase. So what now? Well, Captain Quark, who is me, that brings us to... Girl with a stick. Girl with a stick. <laughs> Often cited in interviews with many insomniacs, Ratchet and Clank started out as Girl with a Stick, a Zelda type game with some Tomb Raider spice thrown in. Codenamed I5 for Insomniac Game Number 5, it started you out as a young African boy, then changed to a Mayan guy, then evolved to the Girl with the Stick. And that was the name that stuck. As the main character kept evolving, they could never quite get the human proportions right, as they had been making non-human characters for so long in Spyro. Stick Girl went from too cartoony to too mundane. Then the hardware became an issue. With little time, they had to fast track their jump from the PS1 to the PS2. At the time, they were still on the old Spyro engine. So programmer Al Hastings and TJ Bordelion, their tools programmer, had the difficult task of getting the engine to where their artists could actually build and prototype environments as well as characters. Some help came from their design consultant, Mark Cerny, who had worked on the VU code as part of the first ever PS2 engine. 
What that means is that Mark knew a thing or two about the system, and wouldn't you know, he would go on to become the lead architect for the PlayStation 4 and 5. Alan, TJ, and mere months managed to get the tools up and running for the artists. It was still crude and probably wouldn't work on second generation PS2 titles, but it was a start. As the artists went to work, they pushed the design away from Spyro's medieval castles. In fact, they made a conscious effort to devoid the game of technology, using vines, wood poles, and hay to build most of the structures in the game. There would be magic and abilities in the game, which you got when you did these katas, as they were called. The design they were going for was a more mature look, because they were thinking that the PS2 player base would be older. Welcome to the third place. As the team kept redoing aspects of the game for a more mature, less cartoony look, the team started to lose excitement for the project. Or maybe there was no excitement there to begin with. Ted Price was sensing his crew's lack of enthusiasm for the game. He did his best to keep his crew's spirits up, but no one seemed to like where the project was heading. The passion for the project was fading. Working on it was now just work. After a year of working on Girl with a Stick, they had built a first playable demo and presented it to Sony. Sony didn't hate it. They didn't love it either. They told Ted they would support Insomniac in making this game, if that's the game they really wanted to make. Sony's executive producer, Connie Booth, told them that they may want to rethink the direction they were taking. She further explained that the adventure genre on the PS2 was going to be very crowded when they planned to release. She then added that she believed that they weren't playing to their strengths. Ted's reaction was, No, no, <laughs> we put so much effort into this into this game, this girl with a stick game. It's going to be great. And the team is looking at me going, Ted, you're crazy. <laughs> we really think we should go back and do what we're good at. Girl with a stick could be a good game. Might sell well, but to grind the team through another year on a game they weren't happy on would destroy them. Morale was already the lowest it had ever been at the company. In the coming days of March 2001, Ted called an all-hands meeting. The Insomniacs walked in, expecting a motivational speech to get them excited about the game they weren't excited about. Instead, Ted announced, Girl with a Stick was canceled. For the team, this was... Insomniac was now reinvigorated and pumped to work on something that had nothing to do with sticks. Excited as they were about Girl with a Stick's demise, still needed an idea. It's 2001. Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone would be the biggest movie of the year, and Mariah Carey's film Glitter was the biggest bomb of the year. And that's what they needed. They needed a Harry Potter level idea, not a glitter idea. The PS2 was already out in crushing sales charts. They needed an idea, and they needed one fast. Luckily, two weeks after Girl with a Stick was canned, Brian Hastings gave a simple but momentous pitch that would change everything. Wouldn't it be great to play an alien that travels from planet to planet collecting weapons and gadgets? Brian Hastings. Boom. Mic drop moment. They dove in. Brian Hastings had been inspired a lot by the novella, The Little Prince, about a prince, obviously, who travels from planet to planet. The book deals with examining the nature of humans and growing up, but that's not important. At least not for this video. The lead character took inspirations from Marvin the Martian, originally. And within mere days after Brian's momentous pitch, the lead character artist, Dave Gurton, had concept drawings. The only thing was, Ratchet was a lizard. The lizard was cute, yeah, but relatability was at an all-time zero. So they attempted many other designs. A scrappy cat, then a tall-looking dog creature. Well, you yeah, know what they say. If you can't beat them, join them. And that's what they did, literally. They merged the two of them together. And that became the character we know and love today. Ted Price dubbed Ratchet species Lombax. One thing rather new that they wanted to do was give Ratchet a voice, which typically in these mascot type games, the protagonists were silent, like Link or Crash Bandicoot. 
But if their lead hero was going to talk, then he needed someone to talk to. And who better than a robot? A C-3PO inspired friend that originally was supposed to be three robots, each acting as a different part that clung to Ratchet, enabling him to utilize them for abilities, weapon upgrades, tools, gadgets, etc., etc. Hardware limitations and confusion on how they all worked together in-game prompted the team to switch to one little robot acting as your backpack. The design for his head actually came from early concept art of Ratchet. Personality-wise, at one point they tried to make him a robot playmate for Ratchet. No, you dumb blarg, not that kind of playmate. Get your head out of the gutter. A child playmate with an actual child voice. And with a British accent. Cool, because we did, if we did it already, uh, we did it. How did this work? It, it really didn't. It ended up being a strange father-son dynamic, and that was not what they were going for. They needed the two more on equal footing. They needed more. Oh, oh, oh. Raj, meet your new partner. New partner. <laughs> they needed more Murtaugh and Riggs from Lethal Weapon. Not exactly like Lethal Weapon, but like Lethal Weapon if Lethal Weapon was a Saturday morning cartoon. In space. The little robot would become known as Clank, a reject robot from an assembly line with a smart analytical calm. The opposite to Ratchet's brass shoot first and ask question later mentality. Clank would serve to help you with traversal across levels. Ratchet and Clank would have a cornucopia of weapons at their disposal. Weapons designs was a whole team affair. All suggestions and ideas, no matter how crazy or how much they defied the laws of physics. All were welcome. A veritable orgy of ideas was thrown out there. The wrench, the pyrocitor, the agents of doom. There's the defense droids, the morph array. A visibomb devastator blaster. They had upwards of 70 plus weapons on a whiteboard, which was way too many, so they pared that down to about 35. That's also including gadgets and items. They would spend three months building and programming the weapons. Many would get cut at the prototype phase because sometimes things sound great on paper, but in actual use, they are anything but. One of these weapons was the Revolverator, a drill gun that you impaled enemies on and took them for a spin. Let me look at that drill. Unfortunately, the spinning slowed down gameplay too much, and the collision detection for the drill bit, to make it believable, made it too small and subsequently too hard to hit enemies. And so was the Mackerel 1000, a fish that you could use instead of Ratchet's wrench. What was its problem? I mean, it sounded funny, right? What happened, Ted? It sounded funny, but when we put it in the game, the humor lasted for about three seconds. Ted Price. The work they did on Girl the Stick proved invaluable, as it had taught them how to make a game on the PlayStation 2. Also, not long after they had gotten on this new Ratchet and Clank train, Jason Rubin, co-founder of Naughty Dog, called up Ted Price and asked if he'd be interested in coming to see their new background rendering technology they were using on their game, Jack and Daxter. Meaning that any improvements Insomniac made to the tech, they would share with Naughty Dog. Insomniac would end up giving some of their occlusion tech to Naughty Dog. The biggest thing though, was that this opened a dialogue between the two companies so that both could better develop games for the PS2, a system that was notoriously known for being hard to develop for. The one thing that we got miffed about in later years, though, was people would say, oh, Insomniac just took Naughty Dog's engine and repurposed it for Ratchet and Clank. I think a lot of our engine programmers were like, uh, no, we both shared components back and forth. We always wanted to make sure people knew that we developed a lot of the tech. Brian Allgaier, lead designer, Insomniac Games. Even though Naughty Dog's tech would help them immensely, the new engine wasn't ready yet. Still, they needed a way to get the artists and designers collaborating on building these levels, even if they couldn't build the levels yet. And they needed to show Sony some kind of demo. This is where Mark Cerny proved his worth yet again. Mark suggested that Insomniac build two diorama levels. What does this mean? It's the literal fake it till you make it. The first diorama was a tropical paradise known as the jungle level with spaceships flying overhead and some crashed ships in the distance. In the distance is where the illusion kicks in, because if you went out there into those crashed ships, 
the super low resolution of those models would cause the whole thing to fall apart. The other diorama level was Metropolis. No, not, not where Superman lives. But a giant futuristic city inspired by the movie The Fifth Element. Flying cars soared around towering skyscrapers. Insomniac always strived to have a somewhat familiar setting. That way you would never feel strange or off-putting when you played the game. The towers were all fake though, kind of like a Hollywood movie set. Fronts that you could only see on camera, but go behind and you see the illusion. The diorama levels they built served as a dual purpose of a demo for Sony and for the artists to collaborate with the designers. These two dioramas were done only a month into the project. The Tropolis diorama level you're seeing here is actually a later version of it because the first version had no plant life, just cars and towers for days. It was Mark Cerny, yet again, suggesting they add some vegetation to the city, which would give it a more alive and unique look. Sony getting the chance to watch these early dioramas was happy and seemingly somewhat relieved they were no longer working on Girl with a Stick. Also in one meeting with Sony of Japan, the Japanese execs liked Ratchet as a character, but they had an issue with his color, which was brown. See, Insomniac already had had an intense internal debate over Ratchet's color. They had looked at so many color palettes. Purple was a hell no, as they had already done too many years with a certain purple dragon. <laughs> Finally, they had settled on brown, which Ted Price thought looked pretty cool. But Sony Japan didn't think so. They suggested yellow and maybe throw some stripes on his ears, to which Ted Price said, And I said, over my dead body. However, lead artist Dave Gurton thought, why not? Let's see what it looks like. So he changed Ratchet's color to yellow and put brown stripes on his ears. The team loved it. And I looked at it and I went, God, that was so wrong. Japanese, our producers were completely right. So we certainly wanted humor to be a prominent aspect of the game. So we developed another franchise favorite, which was Captain Quark. He became such a vital part of the series that when he was left out, fans would actually be upset. We viewed this guy being kind of like a Homer Simpson meets Captain Kirk. Brian Allgaier. If Al can't fix it, it's not broke. Right, Al? Ah. You said it, pal. Where Captain Quark was seen in the Ratchet & Clank universe as an intergalactic hero, beloved by all, but in reality was a self-absorbed glory hog. So, if you think of Quark like a bad actor, then behind every bad actor is a studio exec. Why don't you take a look at that? Insomniac being on the universe a lot, would model the game's final villain after the stereotypical sleazy movie studio executive, which they claimed to have never met at Universal. But this was the inspiration for Drek. Full title? Ultimate Supreme Executive Chairman Alonzo Drek, a dictator over the race called the Blarg. Thank you for your cooperation. Cut! And if you don't like it, you can take your whiny, sniveling, snot-nosed populations, form a line behind me, and kiss my... We're still on? Well, turn it off, you idiot! As they created what was to be Ratchet's home planet, Veldin, they embraced their inner... The story of a boy. Or a Lombax. A girl. Or a tiny robot. And romance. Or bromance. Get off of me, you idiot! And a galaxy. Veldin, where Ratchet grew up, is a desert planet, much like where Luke grew up on Tatooine in Star Wars. Both are young and dream of life amongst the stars, yet both are stuck on a dusty planet. Also, both stories have a super weapon that destroys planets. Oh, whoa. I'd like to point out that the Death Star and the Deplanetizer are two different things. The Death Star just destroys planets, where the Deplanetizer actually takes just a piece of the planet and then puts it into Drek's new planet because he polluted the old one. Now, the rest of the planet that had the piece taken out of spins out of control and then slams into the nearest sun exploding. So, well, I mean, then I guess that does actually destroy the planet. So the Death Star and the Deplanetizer are actually the same. I've said nothing. Insomniac was a small studio at the time, so gameplay came first and all the story and world building would be secondary and a lot of it was actually done on the fly. So if you think they had a grand plan for all the story elements that would come in the sequels? No, they didn't. After hammering out the designs for the first five levels, they realized that each level would be six to seven times larger than a spiral level. 
Ted Price and Mark Swain put together a macro design plan, which would be an outline and guide for all the gameplay elements, levels, and scheduling. This was based off Mark Cerny's The Method, a system for developing and building games better and more efficiently. You can watch his 2002 DICE presentation if it tickles your fancy to know more. We had never made a game before where we didn't have to axe one or more levels at some point in the production process because we were out of time. The Ratchet & Clank macro design was more complex, so we couldn't afford to rip out a level at the last moment. Sony had created a tremendous marketing campaign that relied on a specific release date so missing our delivery dates was not an option. Plus, we were already releasing pretty late in the year, and to miss one week of precious pre-Christmas sales would prove very costly. Ted Price. To this end, they knew they could design 20 levels in their time frame, but dropped that number to 18 because they knew problems would arise. They always do. Those inevitable problems were factored into the macro plan. This meant they would have six weeks to build each level. The level design layout was written on 2D paper mats. I know, pretty caveman by today's standard 3D level design tools. But hey, it worked. We realized to create these environments, it would be an enormous task. Changes in the design process needed to be made. The designers would no longer be working on a single map per designer. We would have to break the levels up into sections. Each designer would specialize in a different task. I was going to work on the enemies. Another designer was going to work on all the traversal elements. And then another designer worked on the mini missions. Brian Allgaier. Utilizing the Naughty Dog tech would allow them to get long draw distances, meaning you could see things in the distance. Many PlayStation 1 games were marred by fog from its graphical limitations. Now, on PS2 and being able to see clearly out in the distance, they wanted each level to have a great view, but also the landmarks would serve as an aid to you so that you didn't get lost in the level. We took a lot of inspiration from theme park design. Like, if you go to Disneyland, you can always see the tip of the Matterhorn. They call them weenies. John Fiorito, art director. Walt Disney's playful term for a visual element that could be used to draw people into and around a space. According to Disney Imagineers, a weenie is big enough to be seen from a distance and interesting enough to make you want to take a closer look. Since those early dioramas, the goal was for the worlds of Ratchet and Clank to have a sci-fi meets the natural world. And everywhere you looked, there would be something to see. From the toxic green air of the planet Oxron, or the island resort of Picataro, which is what the original jungle diorama level eventually became. This level, Eudora, this is where we really started to have a concept for a story within the level that had nothing to do with the story of the game. And the story of this level, for whatever reason, is these are robot loggers. Lumberjack robots. But then we just turn that into the theme of the whole level. So there's like a sawmill in the opening view, and there's spaceships and little hovercrafts hauling the logs away. And that really helped us create unique worlds, where if we could invent these little stories for what went on in the world, regardless of if Ratchet or Clank ever visited, it just helped build the variety and give it its own personality. John Fiorito. On December 3rd of 2001, Naughty Dog's Jack and Daxter would hit the store shelves. The resemblance to Ratchet and Clank was uncanny. It may be hard to believe that Insomniac had no idea the resemblance Jack and Daxter had to their Ratchet and Clank, since they were sharing technology back and forth, but yeah, who knows. After all, beyond the protagonist being a duo and sharing the action platformer genre, the two games are very different. Breaking boxes is the main way you get money in the game. And what is the currency in Ratchet & Clank? Bolts. Acquiring enough bolts allows you to buy many of the game's weapons and ammo. The ching sound behind the bolts every time you grab one is modeled after the sounds you would hear in a casino. That way the bolts would seem more important and valuable. To make things smoother, the bolts will gravitate to you as you get near them. This wasn't in the original design, but it quickly became too frustrating and time-consuming to run around grabbing all the bolts. So they added the bolts flying to you. Later in the game, you get a bolt grabber that does exactly what it says it does. Grab bolts, but from greater distances. It's really nice. For the few, the proud, the few that can grind up to 150,000 bolts, 
No easy task, mind you. Insomniac wanted to make a weapon worthy of the effort. And what better than a weapon called? What's a rhino, anyway? Rip ya a new one. What did you just say to me? Granted, there is an infinite bolt glitch that you can easily get 150,000 bolts, which I would never use. Okay, I, I won't tell if you don't. Prototyping proved vital to Insomniac's process more than it ever had been. The strict time constraints meant they couldn't make any mistakes. They were able to test all the enemies, how far Ratchet could jump, and the weapons all in prototypes before implementing them into the actual game. After they had hammered out building the first five levels of the game, the next vital part of the testing was try it on human subjects. Well, not for real, but in gameplay. Focus tests are some of the best ways to tweak and tune a game so that it can be the best it can be. We had four major focus tests during production. Each focus test featured another 25% of the game until we were testing the full game at Alpha. More than 200 consumers got to play the game before release, and the feedback we collected was invaluable. By recording and charting data from the game, we were able to tune item prices, adjust challenge difficulty, and change monetary rewards. Without this exhaustive process, the game would have probably been unplayable. Ted Price. When questioning players after the playtest, they had to be careful, as to one does not want to lead the witness. So don't ask questions like this. So, Timmy, I see that you were using that pyrocitor weapon a lot. That's probably because it was fun, right? Objection. Leading the witness. So, Timmy, I saw you uh, sat through that Captain Quark scene twice. You know, you didn't skip it. And that's not because you didn't know how to skip it, right? That's just because you actually... You got a thing for the quark. Objection. Leading the witness. So, Timmy, I see you were uh, dying a lot with this swing shot. Is that because it's a hard thing to use, or did you actually just suck with it? Objection. Leading the witness. So, Timmy, what was your favorite part of the game? Objection. That That's actually a fine question. Retracted. The questionnaires help too, though. Sometimes, though, you have to read between the lines, figuratively as well as literally. So the questionnaires were helpful for finding player preferences, but they couldn't always be relied upon. Here's an example of a typical questionnaire. His most preferred weapons was the bubble gun, which I don't know what that is, and then he also liked the bubble gun the least. He gave perfect scores at the bottom, all tens. One of them, uh, I think he gave a 50, I'm not sure. And he thought the gadgets and weapons were just a bit average. So, oh well, who needs those? Of course, for his favorite gadgets, he liked the helicopter and he also hated the helicopter. You know, one of those love-hate relationships. Brian Allgaier. You're welcome. Another thing that helped was tracking the player routes. They could see the paths the testers would take, where they died, where they died a lot, how they died a lot, how often they used the map, and much, much more. The play routes would help out in situations like the helipack. Some people found the helipack fun because they could glide and get out of danger, while others found it very frustrating because they couldn't do all the sophisticated long jump maneuvers. Brian Allgaier. The next thing the focus group showed was trouble in their macro design where testers would get five levels into the game and be required to use six different things and not know where they were. Like they would know where the swing thing was, but then they would be like, where's my hydro thing and the hack thing that I have to hack? Turns out players could only keep track of about three items in their mind at a time. So they went back into the macro design and reworked it. So you would only use about three different item gadgets per level as well as rework a few other things so that the overall playthrough would just be so much smoother. Just as important, though, was the fact that each focus test forced us to get the game working, along with the other deadlines, and sometimes felt we were always in crunch mode. The gameplay programmers in particular lived a nightmare existence between fixing bugs for the next focus disc and trying to move ahead with the new levels. But the constant burns kept us on track and on schedule. Given Ratchet & Clank's scope and complexity, if we had waited until the end of the project to burn playable discs, the bug list would have been overwhelming, and we would have missed our ship date by months. Ted Price.
as we roll deeper into 2002, a sad thing happened. Justin Timberlake and Britney Spears would officially break up. But the hardworking crew at Insomniac had no time to be bothered by this, as they had a game to make. With the data acquired from the focus tests and the macro plan keeping them on track, they were able to implement 90% of what they set out to do in the game. This would be a record for Insomniac. With the gameplay and the world of Ratchet and Clank coming together, they needed to give voice to these characters. For Ratchet, they went with Mikey Kelly, best known for the voice of Michelangelo in the animated Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie aptly titled TMNT. He was also in the short-lived Steven Spielberg animated show, Invasion America. Remember that show? Yeah, me either. For Clank, they received an audition tape from one individual who Ted Price said nailed the voice right out the gate. He basically did the voice without any electronic help. <laughs> Actually, um, I'm a little robot. That voice actor was David Kay. That's me right there. David Kay is known for the voice of Megatron in five different Transformers series. Yes. And Optimus Prime in Transformers Animated. And then the list just goes on and on. But my favorite was that he was Trey's Kuz Renata in Gundam Wing. God would understand the steps we're taking. Just saying. Next on the important list of voices is Captain Quark. What's that? Played by Jim Ward. And one of the first scenes they ever did was with Jim Ward in this scene. Hi, I'm Captain Quark. And believe me, there's nothing worse than staring down a Blargy and Snaggle Beast from the inside and knowing your equipment isn't functioning properly. And it was this scene that proved a very pivotal point for Insomniac as they realized this was the humor and tone of the game. So if you're fighting crime or just fighting grime. <laughs> Jim Ward is also a Ben Tenor doing several voices on that show and a giant, giant list of other voices. Insomniac also filled Ratchet and Clank's world with many other interesting characters you meet along the way. From Big Al, the tech nerd of tech nerds, Helga, the robotic fitness trainer. Ha! Real men can spin without silly toys like that! And this weird animal or guy or something. You will find raritanium for me! No, I will not. Piece of junk. There's many more, too many to cover in the scope of this video. But I do want to mention Skid McMarks, just because the name. Music-wise, they brought in composer David Bourgeau, who says Fatboy Slim's music at the time influenced him greatly for the quirky electronic compositions found in Ratchet and Clank. The way David would compose the music was that Insomniac would send him tapes of gameplay, he would watch through the entire thing, and then send them back music. According to Ted Price, Brigeau nailed the music almost every time he sent it over. Now that Insomniac had the voices, humor, and music, and the gameplay down, everything was looking great. Until it wasn't. They thought it would be easy going from CD-ROMs on the PS1 to DVDs on the PS2. I mean, they were both discs, right? Turns out getting just to the disc burning part was a lot of steps. First, the code and the data needed to be transferred to a PC. To said burner on PC, followed by using burner software, which creates an ISO file, which creates an ISO or optical disc image. After all that, they could burn to an actual disc. All this would take over four hours. Over four hours. And if anything went wrong, and sometimes it did, they would have to start over. Over four hours. From their PS1 disc burning days, the system was very picky, so now on PS2, the Insomniacs were terrified if they change anything, it would break the game, which left them with this really bad disc burning method. Near the end of the project, Ted Price and a few others didn't go home for days because of this. When they got to the end for the final discs, Ted Price said if these gold discs burned, he would sing Britney Spears songs running through the office. The disc failed to burn. But at least the testers were spared Ted's Britney. We in a habit of wanting to make each level better than the last. And a few times, this tendency resulted in layouts that made the artists want to kill the designers. Ted Price. 
Still, they felt it was important to show off the power of the PS2. This led to the ambitious idea of the hoverboard sections and giant clank, and bring the momentous idea from designer Brian Allgaier, where Ratchet would fight enemies on a moving train. At first, I pitched it to the programmers. And usually with programmers, I tend to use the phrase, this is probably impossible, but I thought I'd run an idea by you. That always seems to help for some reason. So they liked the idea, and we did some experiments. I prototyped moving platforms and soon realized that all the weapons were difficult to use due to a change in velocity. Brian Allgaier. Brian then returned to his programmers with the weapon velocity problem, and they figured they could schedule in time to make the weapons work on a moving platform. With the programmers on board, Brian went to present the moving train segment to the art team. And again, artists wanted to kill a designer. Being given only six weeks for the level, the art team was worried that the distance that the train covered, they would need to make way too many buildings to create the background. I'm oversimplifying the art team's dilemma, but basically what this meant, Brian had to go back, make some design changes to the level, make some cuts and nips here. And then they were able to get the sequence in, in all its glory. To the artists and gameplay programmer's credit, they made these and other huge levels work, and they did it on time. And to the designer's credit, they continued to find better and better ways to put more gameplay into smaller areas without sacrificing creativity. In the end, our level design ambitions pushed the limits of time and resources we'd allotted. Ted Price. Working so hard on getting all the levels and gameplay to work, the cinematic cutscenes that were needed to tell the game's story and connect everything were left for last. They were also late to finalize the script. Plus, you gotta factor in the time it took to audition actors and record voiceover. The late start would give the cinematics team only five months to do all the game's cutscenes. When you find out that the cinematics team is also the same team that has to do the in-game animations, well, that five months is more like two and a half months. Their animation lead, Oliver Wade, assembled all the scenes and figured it would amount to over 60 minutes of cinematic movies. <laughs> It's so poetic. A hefty number of animations to do, which approximately equates to about 10 seconds a day from each animator, weekends not included. Fortunately, the animators had finished most of the in-game animations by the time the movies were in full swing, but it was still a real challenge. Furthermore, animating the scenes was just the first step. We had to add programmatic and 20 effects and convert many of the animations into MPEGs before alpha, which stretched many people to the limit. Ted Price. E3 2002. The big gaming trade show of the year taking place at the Los Angeles Convention Center. Insomniac appeared with a trailer and a demo for Ratchet and Clank, next to Sony's other games like Primal and Tekken 4. Here we go! Xbox and GameCube were out in full swing at E3, trying to make their mark. Competition was tough. Nintendo showing off Mario Sunshine, The Legend of Zelda Wind Waker, and Metroid Prime. The old school Metroid and Zelda games had been inspirations for Ratchet and Clank. Xbox was pushing Brute Force. Remember that game? <sighs> Me neither. And I own it. The new Spyro the Dragon game titled Spyro, Enter the Dragonfly was there as well. Insomniac's beloved little dragon was in the hands of others. Insomniac were trying to position Ratchet and Clank as an action-adventure game, as they were trying to shake off their old image of being a platformer studio. The press, quickly upon seeing Ratchet and Clank, dubbed it an action platformer. And that stuck. Oh well, the E3 showing went well enough. Now it was just a matter of finishing the game on time for its November release date. The November release was fast approaching, yet they knew the game needed some replayability. Like, what do you do after you beat it? This is where they came up with Challenge Mode, though it wasn't called Challenge Mode in Ratchet & Clank 1, that was for the sequels. So they added in where after you beat the game, you can restart the game from the beginning, but you retain all your weapons and bolts. This definitely would help getting you closer to affording that Rhino. Unless... 
You can also acquire a gold version of the weapons by collecting gold bolts hidden throughout the levels. The gold weapons don't really do anything special other than look gold, at least in Ratchet and Clank 1. Probably because they added this in so late in the game. Still fighting their way through the poor disc burning process, they faced one final challenge. Localization. They wanted to include both NTSC, the US version, and PAL, the European version, on a single game disc. This meant they had to do all the text for the subtitles early in the process. Like before pre-alpha? And that's not just English. We're talking German, French, Italian, and Spanish. They ended up adding in text mere weeks before the game had gone gold. Gone gold meaning the final version of the game. We made mistakes, and the localization folks in Europe made mistakes when putting fixes into the database. In addition, it took forever to transfer our disks to Europe once they were burned. Eight hours FTP if nothing crashed, 24 hours for a courier. These facts combined meant that we were still desperately trying to resolve some TRC issues hours before the gold disk was due. Fortunately, the game shipped on time in all territories, but I think it prematurely aged our producer in Europe, as well as a few of us here, Ted Price. But they did make it, and on November 4th, 2002, Ratchet and Clank released to the world. Sales were not immediate, but in the coming months, sales picked up, and then they soared. Reviews for the game were mostly positive, sitting here on Metacritic with a nice 88. GameSpot praised it as a fantastic, well-balanced, story-driven adventure. IGN said, beautifully crafted, deep with scenarios, long and filled with various challenges, weapons, and gadgets. IGN also criticized Ratchet's character, saying it was not unique. Whatever. Game Informer felt the game had a slow start, but picked up considerably once you get to the planet Ralgar. The Japanese version of Ratchet and Clank had some alterations to make it viable in the Japanese market. Ratchet's character was altered in some respects to resonate more with Japanese audiences. The people on those planets are hosed. Well, good luck getting Captain Quark to help you. Actually, you could help me. Not in the first game, but in the subsequent sequels, Ratchet's character would get bushy eyebrows for Japan's releases. Why? Because Japan. <laughs> Then there's the five finger rule, where Japanese characters, at least the main ones, must have five fingers because otherwise they are looked upon as mutants or it's a Yakuza thing. The Japanese mafia, or Yakuza as they're called, are known for cutting off your pinky finger to show you wronged them in some way, so Ratchet had to have five fingers. You can see this in other games as well, where the devs were told that their characters must also have five fingers for Japan, such as Crash Bandicoot and Psychonauts. Sony's commercial marketing campaign for Ratchet and Clank consisted of various people trying out the game's weapons in the real world. Oh man! In one commercial, a father and son duo used the decoy weapon, which is a weapon where you can shoot out a blow-up doll version of yourself to distract enemies. They put the blow-up decoy kid in a lawnmower and sent it into the street, where it gets hit by a car as a screaming mother believes her son has been run over. Oh man! Though it's a fan favorite. It got banned, and I can't imagine why. Sony had greenlit a sequel before Ratchet and Clank even released, basically predicting its success. And the relationship would continue with Ratchet and Clank for 17 total games so far. A manga series, plenty of merchandise, a full length feature film. In 2002 for the PS3 marked the release of the Ratchet and Clank collection featuring the first three Ratchet and Clank games with updated graphics. They'd also released this collection on the PS Vita. The feature film released in 2016 was a retelling of the first game. Insomniac, to coincide with the film, remade the first game, which they like to say it's a game based on a movie based on a game. After the first Ratchet and Clank, Insomniac felt there was a lot they could improve upon for the sequel. They felt Ratchet was a bit of a dick. Get off of me, you idiot! And the weapons felt optional. They would tackle these issues as well as many others in the sequel. 
to make a bigger and more badass experience than the first. But that's a story for another day. Thanks for watching. I'm Kev, signing off. Until next time. Thank you.